You have made an amazing edit, and you would like to export it out of Adobe Premiere. I don't blame you. That sounds really nice, but it keeps failing. When I first started editing, I definitely would do this thing where I would make this crazy edit, and then I would try to export it all at one time. It would take hours, and my computer wasn't really powerful enough to do the edit export the edit that I was trying to get and then it might fail at some point or if it did come you know export there would be like some glitch and then maybe it was a repeated glitch. So I remember getting to the end of large projects that I was paid for and being on deadlines and then the one of the most challenging parts was just getting it out of Adobe Premiere and becoming its own independent video file. And if that's the scenario that you're running into, I want to give you a technique that helped me get past that, that I even still use, even now having a much more powerful computer, a pretty beefy machine, and even still, this is something that I do. In a world where nuclear war has begun, vampires fought back in super real 3D. Okay, so before I explain this technique, the first thing I will say is if you have recently done an update to Adobe Premiere, that could be your issue. You might wanna revert back to a previous version, especially if you're using plugins. Oftentimes the plugins may not be uh, up to speed with the exact release of Adobe, or once enough people start using it, once it's public, publicly released, yeah, there can be issues that people start to figure out and then they begin fixing the bug. So always hold off if you can on going to the newest version, use the newest version for very small projects or a new project or a test or a personal, you know, video like this if you're making it, but don't do it for clients. Hold off on that for a second, let everything catch up. This could also be with your graphic card, the version that you have it updated to. It could be a mismatch between the graphic card and Adobe Premiere. So this nightmare can begin. If you had it working before an update, try to revert back to the whatever you had the settings were whenever you had it working last and just stick with that for a while. Now, if it's not that, let's say that you've made this awesome edit and you got it sitting in Adobe Premiere, and it's something that looks kind of like, you know, this, which actually, this isn't even that complicated. By comparison, this is nothing like a music video. And I first learned, figured out starting to do this technique by, I, it was just a requirement to actually pull off the cue the muses music videos in particular that I actually started making a couple of years ago. <laughs> Music videos, I really push the envelope on my color grading. This is where the system starts to bog out, and that's when you're asking it to export something that could be beyond your computer's ability, especially if you start stacking on as many instances of different things as I do. The first thing that I figured out how to do a long time ago was rather than trying to export the entire video as one thing, is export it in chunks. And then you could gradually kind of start consolidating down and figure out where the issue was starting to happen. And then you're kind of waiting an hour at a time, depending on how fast your computer is and what you have. This is something that I went through with much lesser computers. But what I really started using that I absolutely love, and now I just do it. I just do it on all my projects. It just ends up saving me so much headspace when I get towards the end, is I render replace. And if you haven't really taken advantage of it, it's just literally right clicking on any of these clips. And do, do stay with me because it's actually, it's cooler than you might think. Like what's so big and cool about render and replace? Well, one of the things is if you render replace as you go on each chunk of footage that you have, each cut, then your playback is going to be great. Playing back footage in real time without drop frames is a big deal to be able to assess how your edit's really feeling. And you can see over here in my effects control window, how many instances of different things I have for little adjustments. If we hit play, we can see that this is playing very smoothly. This edit has all of these effects on it. If I stop on any singular chunk, you can see all the effects that are on it. And they're grayed out because it's rendered. And that's what's cool is you can actually, when you render replace, you can, you can see all the instances of everything that you put on it. Now you can't drill down and see the exact things that you did for each of those instances, but here's the beautiful thing. If I needed to access this piece of footage again as a raw file, so I could get back my 6K size or my 8K raw size that I actually filmed it in, I can just right click on it and I can hit restore unrendered. Boom. Now I have access to everything that I did 
all the masks that I set up. Everything is just like I hadn't rendered this yet. So that's a huge advantage versus just rendering in chunks. Here's the other really cool thing is, is that you can do handles. So if you were to just export a chunk, you're gonna have exactly those cuts. You don't have any manipulation if you needed to, to make something nudge one way or the other. So if I go over here to this clip that is not rendered yet, all right, and I right click on it and I hit render replace, it brings up the option for the different codecs that I could um, change it over to. In this case, I'm using ProRes 422 HQ. For a lot of corporate stuff, 422 is plenty good. That being said, I actually do like, as a PC user, I like the GoPro Cineform 12-bit with Alpha better. I've noticed that in extreme color grades with music videos that the gradations it provides is better. There's posterization issues sometimes with the ProRes. I've also had some weird artifacting issues with like a violet purple color hue that just kind of emerges around certain edges on the export specifically to ProRes. And then if I go to do it as a GoPro Cineform, instead that alleviates the issue completely. It just doesn't, it's not a part of the algorithm that it does to create that that codec. So that's just a side note to, to know about. But I'm doing ProRes 42 HQ because this is not a crazy color grade like a music video. And ProRes is, is more universal. Now, handles. Handles. What are the handles? Uh, you might understand immediately once you say it. Look, see it. It says 12 frames. I can assign that to be whatever amount of frames I want. I can make it 48 frames. That'd be like two seconds. What is that really doing? It is adding a handle to the front and the back end of the clip that you're rendering. 48 frames, it's gonna give a second at the beginning and a second at the end. That's a bit excessive to me. I like to go with 12 frames. That's plenty for me in most cases, but it depends on the edit. And so what that's gonna allow me to do is if I need to nudge something over, uh, if I want a clip to play longer, you know, or if I realize that somebody made a weird face at the end of something and now I need this video, to, this, this clip to be longer in this direction or that direction, you have that ability and it's already rendered. It, where does it put these clips? It's going to put them in the folder that you tell it. So at the end of this, you can have a render replace folder, okay, of all this ProRes 422 HQ, beautifully color graded footage that's already processed with handles, so it runs longer than the clips that made it into your final edit. And you could open that folder up for repurposed content later for the client and make some other edit, and you could just open up all that B-roll footage. And it's already rendered and, and it looks great. You don't have to open up your old edit and try and grab chunks. That's a huge benefit in itself. How long does it take to render this stuff? That depends on your the power of your machine. For me, it does not take that long, even if I put, if, if I run into an issue where it's taping, taking a super long time, what I'll do is I'll figure out what the effect is that's really making it take that much longer. In this case, oftentimes optical glow from Red Giant that I put on it can bog out on the 6K or 8K footage. It did not in this case. Uh, but if it did, what I would do is I would render replace it to ProRes 422 HQ, and then I would put that optical glow on that clip. Same thing could be said for warp stabilizer. Sometimes you might run into issue if you're working in a 4K timeline and you're using 8K footage and 6K footage and you're resizing it all in, inside of that sequence slash timeline, <clears throat> it may not understand what to do. And so you can have weird glitches with that. Like it doesn't get it. Like with the 8K raw coming from the Canon R5C, I'll put warp stabilizer on it with Adobe Premiere. And then it'll like put it all in one side and all this black space happens because it doesn't know what to do with the 8K inside of the 4K timeline. If you're in to replace it, and you can just put the, the warp stabilizer on that. Now I know it doesn't have as much surface to work with. So on an extreme warp stabilizer scenario, I would still, I would nest that clip into its own nested sequence. And by doing that in that sequence, it's gonna make it the native um, size of the clip itself. And then you can warp stabilize that. We can look up nesting in another video if you don't know how to do that. But in most cases, this can get you by with the warp stabilizer just right there onto the rendered clip if you're having that issue. But just to summarize this again, by doing this, you can watch your video back in your edit in real time with no drop frames. If you want to add on more effects, you could do it as a way of stacking more effects and not draining, you know, getting more out of your system. If you do a bunch of effects or color grades and masking and stuff like that, and you render that, then you put an instance of something else on top there if you want to keep going. It's the first time you're putting an instance of something on there. So, I mean, you can, keep, you can do way more that way. This is the same technique 
that's done in audio really often as well. Like if you have a ton of effects on an audio, you might just render out that audio clip and then start adding more effects on it. And these seem like first instances. If you finish this edit and you export it, uh, it's going to export really fast. It's 42HQ. I mean, your, your computer's not having to do much lifting at all when you go to do your final export. If you see some issue in the final export, minor changes, it's just going to re-export again super fast. You don't have to wait hours if the client wants to change something. The, you're not going to have to worry about processing time. It's just going to take you as long as it took you to edit it, and then it'll almost export in real time. And it's just a, a, a huge way to to get more out of your system, spot errors before they become issues, especially if you, you if you identify that there's some effect that you're using or some technique that's not working in your render for some reason, you can stop it right there. You know, and rather than plastering it across your entire project and then realizing afterwards that you're going to have to go in and pull that out off of every clip. Um, caveat, if it's slow-mo, if it's 60p or 120p or something like that, if you render a place, I don't know if Adobe will fix this. I don't see an area to assign it to manage this rendering differently, but it will be choppy. So for those, I actually do do an in and out point. Then I'll, I'll export manually. You know, it doesn't have the handles, <clears throat> so that's not as nice. And you're going to have to manually drag and drop it and put it back in. But it's not that big of a deal. It's worth it for the few clips that you need to do that to. Unless your whole video is slow-mo, then this isn't going to be a good technique for you. Now, one note is, this is the last note I want to tell you about. Um, if you're using Warp Stabilizer and you go to Render Replace, what you have to do is, if you render replace as is, it's going to have that same banner that popped up while it was making the analyzation. It'll stay there. It'll be in your rendered footage. So you have to go to advanced right here and then you're going to check the box hide warning banner now i i feel like this should just be there by default and it should be the other way if you need to have the warning banner there but anyway that's the way it is if you do that and you render replace there will not be a warning banner there so that resolves that i hope i've sold you on trying it this way if you're having trouble exporting your video with this render replace method you will see what the issue is before you try to export your full video you will identify the effect i think what was happening for me over years is i'm just trying to export way too much at one time having to have it export all of that at one time is a big deal and if it's going to be that big of a thing also and you're having trouble do restart your computer restart the program having a clean catch database and stuff it does seem to make it play smoother i can get better performance for exports out of that way if you notice it running slow reopen the pro program before you start doing big exports but this render replace thing it's just asking for one chunk at a time or you can do a few chunks at a time it depends on you know your computer's capability but the render replace is gold guys it, it, there's so many advantages to it um, and it's so simple and once you start doing it it's hard to not use it and again you can just hit restore to get right back you can even do this restore unrendered grab your whole look which you could you know you could hit Control c for that or you can go in and grab specific ones if you want to from here then once you've copied it you can hit Control z and then you can go over to whatever clip you're trying to add it to and then you can paste those attributes onto the new clip so you could still copy it and then restore the you don't have to re-render it again you can just re Control z restore it again to back to the rendered state and then paste the effects that you just copied from it so very very different than exporting every clip or exporting chunks of your edit and then putting them back in you don't have access to all those things and it, it can make your project just run super smooth and export very fast all right i hope that, that helps you i know that's not the most exciting thing but if you're in this situation where you can't export this can be a godsend and um and a really healthy practice to start incorporating into your edits period, especially if your computer is not as powerful as what you're asking it to do. A lot of people, a lot of people, including myself, you will get a camera that is more capable than your computer is. <laughs> so you'll get these cameras out now with crazy raw abilities and your computer can't really handle it that well. Uh, this is a solution, one of the solutions in addition to using proxies. Um, which is a different video, and I do have one on that, that really, really can be a game changer for your workflow. Movie Voice.